Good morning, and welcome as we gather in this place for worship on a holiday weekend. For those of you who are just wishing you were on a boat in a lake somewhere, it's raining, so that's God's way of saying you should be in worship. And we're thankful that we're here today to celebrate who God is. Indeed, today we celebrate with Christians around the world, the large global church, because today is Pentecost Sunday, the day when we remember that God did not leave us as orphans, but sent His Spirit to come among us, to dwell within us, to move through us. And so we're celebrating with the global church, Pentecost Sunday. With our national church, we also are commemorating today Memorial Day weekend, and Memorial Day we're remembering with gratitude to God the sacrifice of those who have served this country and preserved the freedom that we have to gather here this morning. And we'll be doing that tonight for a combined Memorial Day service. If you're a visitor with us, it's, the information's in the bulletin, but tonight's service will be not at 6 p.m. our normal time, it'll be at 7 p.m., and it won't be here, it will be at First Reformed, not First Christian Reformed, First Reformed, but will be the host church. So 7 p.m. tonight, a combined Memorial Day service, you're all invited, we'll be joining with congregations from around Sioux Center as we praise God's name this evening. And also, one other final announcement, we had the Global Church with Pentecost, our National Church Memorial Day. Congregationally, we are going to have a Q&A session after the service this morning. We have the opportunity to consider buying a piece of property right adjacent to the church just across the road here for additional parking. If you have questions about that, there is information in your boxes. But right after the service today, there's a chance just to ask more questions, to hear more information. We invite anyone who's interested to come to that. We'll vote on it next week, Sunday. With those words of announcements, let's open the service bowing our heads and praying together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings that you pour down in this world, even as you have sent rain this morning. Lord, among those blessings is the blessing of this congregation and of each member, each guest. And Lord, we thank you that even as we consider today your leading on a piece of property, that you are the God who guides this congregation. Father, we thank you for the blessing of this nation, for the place where we can worship you in freedom, for the opportunities we have to live and to work and to build your kingdom in this time and this place. Lord, we thank you for those who have given their lives and of those who have given of their lives in service to this nation. And Heavenly Father, more than all these things, we thank you today for the gift of your Spirit, that you are here now, that you dwell among us, that you move through us. Heavenly Father, we pray that your Spirit would be welcomed again, move among us in new and even more powerful ways than you've ever moved before, shape us to be Jesus Christ, and send us into your world to live for you. Father, we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. And so would you please stand for our call to worship. <clears throat> On this Pentecost Sunday, our call to worship are those familiar words from Acts 2 where Peter is quoting the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Looking to the time when the Spirit will come, Peter and Joel say, but everyone who calls on the Lord will be saved. And we do that calling on the name of the Lord now in worship, singing together, Come Thou Almighty King, Psalter Hymn number 246. Let's sing together the four stanzas.
have prayed for our God to come. He is here with this word of greeting to God's elect strangers in the world who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. To each of you be grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father. Amen. Would you please turn on this rainy Pentecost Sunday and greet those around you, especially any who are guests with us today. Friends, you may be seated as we continue in a posture of worship, and maybe the most appropriate posture of worship would be to take off your shoes. We say that the Holy Spirit is here. That means this is a holy place, and one of the ways we recognize that with Moses in the burning bush is to take off our shoes and to be still and know that the presence of the Lord is here. Our next song speaks of that, Be Still for the Presence of the Lord. song invites us to be still, and we enter in that stillness into a time of confession, hearing these words from John 15. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. That spirit of truth shows us the truth about God, but also reveals the truth about ourselves and our need for a Savior. Let's have that spirit do these things now as we pray in a prayer of confession. Would you join me? Gracious God, you do send us the spirit of courage. And yet we confess that so often we are afraid. You send us the spirit of truth. But we confess so often we cling to our illusions. You send us your spirit of healing. But so often we cannot let go of our hurts. Holy Spirit, you know the struggles each one of us bring to this place. You know the sins and the failures of this past week. We dare not name them, nor do we need to, because you are so close to us. You have witnessed everyone. And yet we thank you that you also are the spirit of forgiveness. And so we ask that you would come again, that you would shake our hearts, that you would set our souls on fire that you would fill us with your love and send us into your world forgiven and cleansed and rejoicing in your power. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would also make us new, 
set us free. And in this week, may we live in your justice and in your love. For we pray this through the power of the Spirit of truth in the name of Jesus. Amen. With that prayer, we continue now in song, a song that assures us of what God does, eternal spirit, God of truth. Psalter hymn number 422, let's sing the two stanzas. And as children of the Lord redeemed by Christ's own blood, that same Spirit who moves us to cling to the Christ who forgives us now moves us to live in His image. Hear these words is a guide for this week from Galatians chapter 5. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. That is our call this week, to walk with the Spirit. And our song of dedication speaks of that. Psalm to hymn of 427, Dwell in me, O blessed Spirit. That same spirit that has walked us through this time of confession and sends us forth now also speaks to us through the living word. I invite you to turn with me to the book of Acts this morning. It's going to be Acts chapter 8, and that is on page uh, 1016 and 1017 is where we're going to be today, 1016, Acts chapter 8. 
Last week we finished a series on human relationships. This week I'll be doing sermon planning, so I'll be off next Sunday. The following week we'll be beginning a new series for the summer months. That's going to be a series where we're going to take a step back. Rather than zeroing in on a specific book or a specific set of topics or a set of scriptures, we're going to be moving from Genesis to Revelation, trying to capture this summer what's the big story of scripture. And we're going to do that through little stories that involve trees. And we're going to call the series Forest of Grace. That's next in two weeks. But this Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. This is a Sunday when we remember one of the greatest events in the history of the world when God himself and the third person of the Trinity didn't just take on flesh and live on the earth, but that spirit lives within us. The miracle of Pentecost. And today we're going to reflect on that through this text in Acts chapter 8. And as we do, our goal today, our prayer is that we will see how the Spirit is at work in the world, but also in our own lives. And with that, let's pray as God speaks to us today. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent your Spirit. And flames that spread through a room and the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy and the gift of apostles who raised the dead and healed the sick, these wonders, these miracles, these signs, and yet we thank you, Lord, that you continue to send that same Spirit. Heavenly Father, we welcome that Spirit, and we pray that now your Spirit and your Word would stir among us. Lord, that you would give to us a deeper measure of an experience of you, that you would give to us a deeper measure of an experience of Christ. Heavenly Father, may you do each of these things to your glory today. For We pray them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Acts chapter 8, we're going to begin reading at verse 4 and read through verse 25. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is the divine power known as the great power. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. And Peter and John placed their hands in them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw it, the Holy Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands. He offered them money and said, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart, for I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me, so that nothing you said may happen to me. When they had testified and proclaimed the word of the Lord, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, in this Pentecost Sunday, what I'd like us to do is reflect on and wrestle with simply two questions. The first question is very basic. Do you have the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit a real presence in your life? That's the first question. And the second question is, how would you know that? If your answer to that first question is no, the Holy Spirit is not some, something that's real in your life, how do you know he's not real? And if your answer is yes, the Holy Spirit is in my life, 
How do you know that He's there? Do you have the Spirit? How would you know? Those two questions before us are difficult questions. And maybe for some of us, they're going to be a little bit disturbing as we reflect through them. But what I want us to do is reflect on those questions through two categories of philosophy. Because philosophy says there's two ways we can know. One of those ways is what we call a priori knowledge. You might see the English word prior there. That means to know prior or before or independent from experience. For example, the statement, all bachelors are unmarried, you don't have to get out of your couch and do any exploration. You just know that statement's true by definition, a priori. But there's another way of knowing. That's called a posteriori. You see the word posterior. That means what you know after or through experience. So if I would say the majority of bachelors are messy, you wouldn't know that lying on your couch, unless you're a bachelor and you see it's messy. You actually have to experience it. You have to do surveys, explore the world, and then you can define if that's true or not. So my question today is, I say, how do you know is which way of knowing is the Spirit? And Christians give different answers. Some Christians say that the way you know you have the Spirit is a priori. It's not based on experience at all. It's based on doctrine. And so sacramental Christians will say, look, if you've been baptized, by definition, a priori, you have the Spirit. If you've been baptized, you have the Spirit. Evangelicals might say, no, if you've been converted, if you've accepted Jesus, that was God's Spirit moving you to accept Jesus. We're told that if you have Jesus, you have the Spirit. So by definition, you have the Spirit. You can answer yes, regardless of your experience. But there are other Christians in the charismatic or Pentecostal movements who say, no, the way you know the Spirit is not a priori. It's not a point of doctrine. It's a point of experience. You know you have the Spirit because you've experienced something. You've felt something. You've seen something. Something's happened that you'll never forget. That The point of having the Spirit is not just a deductive logic. It is a lived reality. So do you have the Spirit? How would you know? We're going to answer those two questions by looking at this text. And this is an interesting text to give you a little background on it. The beginning of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, which is when Jesus ascends into heaven, which we saw last week Sunday. In that time before he ascends, Jesus gives a promise and he gives a program for his disciples. Acts 1 verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. That's the promise. And then the program. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You're going to receive power in the Spirit. It's going to come on you. And then you'll be my witnesses in three, these areas. And really the book of Acts is a following of that program. That's Acts 1. In Acts 2, the Holy Spirit comes in power on people in Jerusalem and Judea. That's Pentecost Sunday. Acts chapter 8, which we just read, is the Spirit comes in power in people in Samaria. And then Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 19, the Spirit comes in power on Gentiles to the ends of the earth. So that's the story of Acts, the Spirit coming in power. These many Pentecost in Acts 8, which we're reading today, is the Samaritan Pentecost. And yet in chapter 8, what we see is not just the coming of the power of God, but we see that there's also been struggle. In chapter 7, a man named Stephen has been stoned and killed. He was one of the seven deacons. And in chapter 8, verse 1, we read this then. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered. And chapter 8 picks up one of those persons who were scattered in one of the places where he was scattered. The next verse, those who have been scattered preached the word, and Philip went down to a city in Samaria. Now, who is this Philip, and where did he go? Well, this Philip is not the apostle Philip. This is actually one of the deacons, just like Stephen. This is one of the men in Acts chapter 6 who were filled with the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Seven men who were appointed to wait on tables, but just like Stephen, Philip doesn't just wait on tables, he preaches. And this man, Philip, filled with the Spirit and wisdom, goes to Samaria. Now, what's Samaria? They started in Jerusalem. Samaria is a region where the northern kingdom was until 722 B.C. when Assyria conquered them, took the Israelites to exile, and filled the land with other peoples. And so by the first century, Samaria was a place of half-breeds and heretics, mixed ethnicity and mixed religion. And because of that, it was hated by the Jews. But kicked out of Jerusalem, Philip makes his way up the mountains of Judea, probably to Shechem, um, in that time known as Neapolis. That would have been where the Jewish and the Samaritan people lived. 
And there he preaches the word of God. And while there, he catches the attention of the whole city. Notice in verse 6. When the crowds heard Philip and they saw the signs he did, they all paid close attention. Spirits are cast out, evil spirits, the the sick are healed, the paralytics are walking, the whole city is abuzz. He's got the attention of the city. But he doesn't just capture the attention of the city, he captures the attention of a certain person. Philip is not the only power in town, nor is he the first. Verse 9, now for some time a man named Simon had practiced sorcery. He had amazed the people of Samaria and they followed him because he amazed them for a long time with his magic. We're told this man was known as the great power. People either thought that this man himself was God or that he was the representative of God. We don't know if he was an illusionist, maybe someone like David Copperfield or Henry Houdini or um, Penn and Teller, someone who could pull rabbits out of hats and do cool card tricks. But it's also possible, rather than just being an illusionist, that he was filled with real power, demonic power. Matthew 24, verse 24 says that in the last days there will be false prophets who will do signs and wonders to deceive even the elect. A little bit later in Acts 16, we see a woman who is filled with a demon who can predict the future. So more than likely, this is not just David Copperfield. This is someone who has real dark magic and is amazing and deceiving a whole town with it. And yet when Philip comes and captures the attention of the town, he gets this man's attention too. And notice verse 13. Simon himself believed and was baptized. The one who astonished others has now astonished himself by the signs and miracles he saw. Think of the revival. This is Dumbledore now joining First Baptist Church. Voldemort is teaching crafts at VBS. Gandalf the Grey has joined the worship team and is belting out amazing grace. The wizard has become a Christian. An amazing revival. And that captures the attention of people outside Samaria. In fact, it captures the attention of the top people in Jerusalem. And so we read the next verses, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted, they sent Peter and John to them. And this is where the story gets disturbing. Because up to this point, the Spirit has come, everyone's been been converted, things have been happening, it's wonderful, but when the apostles come, notice what they do. When they arrived, they prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Now that's disturbing because we wonder why don't they have the Holy Spirit already? In verse 12, we read that everything was there for the Spirit to be there. Notice verse 12. When they believed Philip as he preached the good news, that's gospel, he preached the gospel, the kingdom of God, the full extent of the gospel, the name of Jesus, he preached exactly what you need to preach. Gospel, kingdom, Jesus. They believe and they were baptized. Now for most of us, we would say a priori, that means they have the Spirit. They've been baptized. If you're baptized, you've got the Spirit. Check. They believed. If you believe, you have the Spirit. Check. And yet notice what we read in verse 16. The Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. So they put their hands in them, and then the Spirit comes. Is anyone a little disturbed with me about that? That the idea that you don't have the Spirit because you're baptized in a believer, that you need some second step, some new ritual, some different thing to happen, otherwise you're missing out? And this isn't just the disturbing thing in Acts chapter 8, the Samaritan Pentecost. Actually, it runs all throughout these stories. Acts is the second half of a book that Luke began with the Gospel of Luke. And at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 3, John the Baptist says this. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So already at the beginning, we're told there's not just a baptism and you have the Spirit. There is a baptism with water, but there's a second baptism with fire. And that's what we saw in Acts chapter 2 in Pentecost. The disciples in Pentecost already believed. They already had been baptized. In fact, we read in the Gospels, they already were baptizing others. But in Acts chapter 2, there's a sound like the blowing of the violent wind. Tongues of fire come and settle upon them, and they're filled with the Spirit. There is a second baptism, a second experience that's visible 
and subsequent and real. We see that same pattern in Acts 19. Here we have Paul found some disciples, some manuscripts say in a CRC, and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, no, we haven't even heard there is a Holy Spirit. When Paul placed his hands in them, the Spirit came. Okay, these are disciples, they're believers, they were baptized, and they don't have the Spirit. In fact, Jesus said this when he ascended into heaven, Acts 1. John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So what it seems like here is that there are two baptisms. There is a baptism with water, and there is a baptism with the Holy Spirit. And many Christians say you need to have both. You can define that baptism with the Spirit this way. It is a baptism is a distinct and separate experience from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that occurs at salvation. So if you're saved, we believe as Calvinists, you didn't get saved by your own power. The Spirit entered you, renewed you, moved you to claim Jesus as Lord is in you. But that's just part of it. You need to also have a subsequent visible filling of the Spirit. For example, John Piper says this, The essence of being baptized with the Holy Spirit is when a person who is already a believer receives extraordinary spiritual power for Christ-exalting ministry. This is after you believe, this is a second new thing, and it gives you visible power and experience of God. Another set of writers, the Bennetts, who wrote probably the most important book on Pentecostalism, the Holy Spirit and and, um, you, say, say this, The first experience of the Christian life, salvation, is the incoming of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ to give us new life, God life, eternal life. The second experience is receiving or making welcome of the Holy Spirit so that Jesus can cause him to pour out in us his new life, to baptize our souls and bodies with refreshing and renewing power. You need two baptisms. And in fact, the Baker Encyclopedia of Scripture says that if you want to understand the Spirit from Acts, you can't imagine it as some sort of silent, secretive thing that you know a priori. It is always a posteriori. It's always experiential. In Acts, there could be no doubt as to whether the Spirit had been given or not. Luke does not know of any silent, invisible giving or filling of the Spirit. If the Spirit comes, you will know it. So what's that mean for us? What if the Spirit that we've been given in baptism or in conversion is simply a spirit within, but we need a spirit upon. Some of these writers say the difference is we've been, the spirit gives salvation and sanctification. That's the first baptism. But he also gives power for ministry. That's the second. If you want to think of it visually, when you drink a glass of water, you get water within you. But you also need to then jump in the pool to get water around you. Baptism means immersion. It is immersion in the Spirit. Not just a drink within, but a splashing around without. That the first baptism gives us the life of Jesus. The second baptism is to give us the power of Jesus. And so are we missing out? Could it be that some of us have been baptized in water, but we haven't been baptized in fire? Could it be some of us have the life of Jesus, we're saved, but we're missing the power of Jesus? Could it be that some of us have had a drink, but we haven't had a dunk? We've had a sip, but we haven't gone for a swim. And maybe that's why rather than raising the dead as the apostles did, we just bury them. Rather than healing the sick, we just write them cards. Rather than speaking in tongues, we wag our tongues. Rather than prophesying, we just prognosticate. Because we are saved, but we're only saved. We don't have the power. Do you have the Holy Spirit? How would you know? Have you had that experience of the Spirit? Now, what are we to make of that? That idea that there are these two experiences, the baptism first of water and then a second subsequent different baptism with fire. What are we to understand of that? Well, today I want to say something negative about that something clarifying, and then finally something positive. First of all, what, when we think about this negatively, I think that this understanding of two baptisms is too neat and tidy. Even though I respect John Piper, I respect the Bennetts, I respect some charismatic friends of mine who believe this and love Scripture, I think by saying there are these two things always in the same order, they're making the Scriptures a little bit too neat and tidy. So for example, 
In Acts chapter 2, the Spirit does come after water baptism. And in Acts chapter 8, they're baptized and they believe, and then the Spirit comes after that. So there is this pattern. But if you read the book of Acts, you'll see that that's not always the pattern. For example, in Acts chapter 10, the sequence is reversed. Peter is still speaking. When the Spirit comes, and all who heard the message. And Peter says, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Spirit. So in that case, it's not that you're baptized first with water and then the Spirit comes. Here the Spirit comes and then you're baptized with water. So the idea that there's always this subsequent thing is actually not fitting the pattern of Scripture. At times they come together, at times one comes first, at times the other comes first. It's not just the sequence, it's also the manifestation. Some charismatics say if you've had this spirit, spirit baptism, you're going to know it because you're going to speak in tongues. That's the sign of the Spirit. And that's what you see in Acts 2 with Pentecost. That's what you see in Acts 10 with Cornelius. And that's what you see in Acts 19 in Ephesus. But here in Acts 8, they're filled with the Spirit, but we're not told they spoke in tongues. And in fact, nine times in, the gospel, in, in, in Acts, we're told people are filled with the Spirit, but there's no mention of tongues. So it's not like there's one manifestation which will clue you that you have the Spirit. You're going to have power, but that power can look in a lot of different ways. And it's also, I think, a little too simplistic of terminology. The phrase baptism with the Spirit never occurs in Scripture. It occurs in a verbal form. People are baptized in or with the Spirit, but there's never a baptism, a noun of the Spirit. It's not a thing in Scripture. And in fact, if you read through the New Testament, there's a lot of ways this is pictured. Baptized with the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, the Spirit falls upon. And if you go through all those things, you'll see they come in a lot of different ways. It's not too neat and tidy baptisms. And so I think as much as I respect these authors, they're making something out of Scripture that's not clearly there. That's the negative. Here's the clarifying. I think if you read the New Testament, what it's pointing us to is one baptism, not two, but many fillings. What do I mean by that? Well, there's just one baptism that the New Testament really knows of. Acts chapter 2 Peter replies, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. That's the same thing that Philip did, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't say, be baptized, and by the way, some of you might actually also receive the Spirit later on in a second one. Be baptized, and you will receive the Spirit. The baptism and the Spirit go together, and there's just one. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For we are all baptized by one spirit into one body, and we are all given one spirit to drink. Now notice that image of drinking the water within versus being splashed without. They're combined here. You're baptized, which means you're immersed in the spirit, and you're given one spirit to drink. The immersion and the infilling are the same thing in 1 Corinthians 12. Ephesians 4. There is one body, one spirit, one baptism. It's not a body that has two baptisms and a body that has one baptism and there are different levels there. There's just one baptism, one spirit, one body. Ephesians 1. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. We make Scripture too neat and tidy when we say that it has to happen in two different steps in two different ways. The idea of Scripture is when you believe, You were marked with the Spirit. But with that marking, there's many times where the Spirit will fill us in new ways. So in Acts chapter 4, for example, in Acts 2, the disciples were filled with the Spirit, Pentecost, the baptism that Jesus talked about. But notice in chapter 4 what happens. They prayed, and the place where they were staying was shaken, and they were all filled a second time with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the Word of God boldly. This baptism wasn't a one-time event and and never happened again. They were filled in Pentecost, chapter 2, and they're filled here in chapter 4, and they're filled other times. It's not a baptism in the Spirit. It's baptisms in the Spirit. It's not a filling of the Spirit so much as it's fillings of the Spirit, fresh anointings, fresh experiences. That is the idea of Scripture. So you could summarize it this way, that there is... um, Ephesians 5 is another example. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but be, and it's a present tense verb, be continually filled with the Spirit. There's many fillings. You could say all believers are fully have the Spirit within us, but at times we are especially empowered by the Spirit upon us. One baptism, many fillings. That's the clarifying comment. 
what's the positive one about this teaching? I want to end with the positive because I do think there's something we need to learn from the charismatic church. And what we need to learn is this, that the presence of the Spirit in our lives is a gracious and life-changing experience. That if someone asks you, do you have the Spirit and how would you know? It's not just a priori from points of doctrine from the catechism. I was baptized so I have the Spirit. It is also a posteriori. It is also an experience. That's how God wants us to come to Him. And that's what the Scriptures point us to again and again and again. For example, in 2 Corinthians. Now God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ, He anointed us, filled us, sent His seal of ownership on us, and put His Spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. A guarantee is no guarantee if it's not visible. The point of a guarantee is to say you're not experiencing all that you will, but here's a taste. This that you're experiencing now is a guarantee of what you will experience. We are meant to experience the Spirit. It's supposed to be real and tangible. John Piper says this, and I agree with him. The really valuable contribution of the charismatic renewal is their relentless emphasis on the truth that receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit is a real, life-changing experience. Christianity is not merely an array of glorious ideas. It is not merely the performance of rituals and sacraments. It is the life-changing experience of the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus Christ as Lord of the universe. The Spirit is real. And every one of us should have a testimony, not necessarily of a feeling that we had or of some time when we walked on water or, or babbled in different tongues, but our experience that there is a power of God beyond ourselves at work in our lives. That is the sign that God is there. But how do you get that sign? Do you have to do some sort of special incantation? Is it raising your hands at a certain angle that the Spirit comes? How do you do that? Well, Simon wondered the same thing. Simon, who knows about power and miracles and signs and wonders and how to impress people, he wants to have this power too. And notice Peter's response to him. You can't get the Spirit by buying it. You can't get it with your money or your effort or your own righteousness. You can't manipulate the Spirit. There is no ritual that you can master. The Spirit is the gift of God. It's the same word from Acts 2. The Spirit is the gift. It is not something we can earn, but it is something we receive. Graciously given by God to all who believe. It's a gift. And that gift comes to us not in the flashy only, but it comes to us in the power. Simon wanted to do a new trick. God wants to transform. And that's where you know you have the Spirit. How do you know you have it? Because God's changing you. What's the sign of the Spirit in Acts chapter 8? There is no speaking in tongues. There is no prophecy. What's the sign of the Spirit? I suggest the clearest sign of the Spirit is in what happened to John, the apostle. Remember, Acts is the second half of Luke. In Luke chapter 9, John, the apostle, is in Samaria. Jesus set his face to Jerusalem. He's on his way to the cross. And this is what we read in Luke chapter 9. Jesus sent messengers ahead who went into a Samaritan village, probably Neapolis, to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. Remember, they hate each other. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? That's John's attitude. His heart was filled with bitterness and with anger, and he wanted to destroy these people. At the end of Acts 8, what do we see? Verse 25. When they had testified and proclaimed the word of the Lord, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. That's the Spirit. Not just the charismatic, flashy things which God does give, but which are not the point. The point is the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Not magic tricks that impress, but transformation that renews the world. A fisherman from Galilee who hates Samaritans and wants to call down fire, now loving Samaritans and calling down the fire of the Spirit to save them eternally. That is how you know you have the Spirit. That transformation. And I want to end with a story of how that can look in our own neighborhood. 
a member of our church at Bethel who doesn't speak in tongues or prophesy or any of those things was at home and just had an impression that she had to make some cookies. I asked her permission to share this. She had to make some cookies. She was thinking of her grandmother who was a diabetic, and so she made some diabetic cookies. She didn't know who they were to go to, though. So she put the cookies in her car, and she drove down the road, and she saw a farmer in a field by the fence line, so she stopped the car on the road, and she runs the fence line, waves down the farmer, has the plate of cookies, and said, Sir, would you like some cookies? The farmer said, I'm sorry, I, I'm a diabetic. I, I can't eat cookies. She began to cry. She shared with him that they were diabetic cookies. And he began to cry. His wife had died two and a half months earlier and he hadn't had a sweet since she died. That is, in a quiet way, God meeting the need of a neighbor through a voice within us and around us. A voice that renews us, that transforms us to give for others, to look for the good of others. At times speaks to us in supernatural and powerful ways, but that is the Spirit. And on Pentecost Sunday, that is the Spirit that is here. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, do we have the Spirit and how would we know? We thank you that we know through the truth of Scripture, which is bigger than our experience, which is greater than our hearts, that we who have been baptized and believed do have the Spirit, that your Word tells us this. But thank you that also your Spirit shows yourself to us, that we know through the experience of little by little putting to death our old selves, of little by little seeing your life come upon us, of finding increasingly that we hate sin, that we have died to it, Increasingly that we are made alive in Jesus Christ. Not the tricks of new magic, but the transformation of a new life. Lord, may this fruit of the Spirit be manifest in us. May it be a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. May you assure us of our salvation and make us to be signs and seals for a world to see you as well. For Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank God for the gift of the Spirit that He gives, and our song of response speaks of that gift of Christ for God the Father. Let's stand to sing.
Amen. And you may be seated. As through the Spirit we make our prayers to God as we do today, one item we'll be praying for, we'll be expressing our condolences and asking for God's peace on uh, the family of John Van uh, Mindorp, that'd be Neil and, and Trina, and Myron and Fran and their families. Uh, he passed away from a stroke. The funeral was this week. We want to pray for them and their loss. With that, would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that through your Spirit you are on the loose. That you are on the march in this world, that you are not confined to the walls of churches with steeples, or even confined within the artwork that we hang in our Christian homes, but that you are moving around in this world. In places even of darkness where magic is practiced, where human lives are abused, where governments are corrupt, your spirit is at work in this world, restraining evil, at work through the presence of your body in even places of persecution and war, people filled with the spirit. Reflecting a life transformed, a life beginning to model the life of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you for this gift. Lord, we thank you in Pentecost that you remind us of the unity we have in the church. That there is one Lord, one faith, one spirit, one baptism. Heavenly Father, we see how in Acts 8 you joined together the church in Jerusalem and the church in Samaria, these two congregations which would hate each other and distrust each other. Yet through the work of your spirit and the common experience of your grace, united together. And Lord, we thank you that we are united with churches of every nation and every tribe and every tongue, every ethnicity in the same unifying spirit of Christ. Heavenly Father, in the midst of this gift, we also thank you as a nation for the further gift of those that your spirit has moved to serve. And we thank you for those who have served in the military actively now and who have in past years in the National Guard in every branch. We thank you for those also in their families, for their mothers, for their wives, for their children who bore this sacrifice as well. And Father, especially today, we thank you for those who gave their lives in defending the freedoms of this nation. But we see in a small way in their sacrifice the echo of the greater sacrifice that Christ made on our behalf. Heavenly Father, we also thank you today for the work that you're doing in this congregation. We thank you for everyone who volunteers, for everyone who uses the gifts that you give. Lord, for each of these gifts, whether of music or administration, whether helping out quietly through service in nursery or in kitchen, through leadership, Lord, each of these gifts are fruit that your Spirit is showing that you are at work in us and through us. Lord, we thank you for that. As a congregation, we ask today that your Spirit would also guide us. Through the Q&A this week and through the congregational meeting next week, we ask that your will would be done. Lord, if this is a property that you would have us buy, we ask that you would make that clear. If not, that you would make that clear, that together we would walk in unity and in step with you. Heavenly Father, we thank you also for the gifts that you've given this community. We thank you for the schools, for the teachers and staff, for the students. Especially, again, we thank you for the graduations of the past week and also now for middle school and elementary as they finish up a school year. Lord, may you bless the learning that's still to be done and bless the summer months. Heavenly Father, we thank you with Mike and Pam Holstein and their family for the wedding yesterday of their daughter Amanda and John. We pray your blessing on this young couple. We thank you that you are a God who gives us the gift of other people to share life with and to love. Lord, even for those of us who are single, we thank you that that gift extends beyond our nuclear families into this family of spirit-filled people that we are knit together with. Heavenly Father, we thank you not just for the young, but also for the elderly. We thank you with Aline Van Voorst, that you brought her to a new place and a new season of living in Crown Point. We pray your blessing on her and on this transition. Heavenly Father, we also do thank you that your family of faith, led by the Spirit, goes forth with the gospel. Lord, we thank you that Josh and Joni could be with us today. We pray your blessing on them as they go back to Nicaragua to serve. May your Spirit go with them, be freshly upon them. Lord, we thank you with the Sorens as they work and minister in Costa Rica. We pray that your spirit also would equip them as they equip new leaders in your church to plant churches and to bring your gospel, not just in Costa Rica, but around the world. Heavenly Father, we do pray that that same spirit would also, with comforting wings, overshadow those suffering in Nepal. We continue to pray for Troy and Faith Birma and their teammates as they respond with others in the wake of these earthquakes. May you give them wisdom. May you give them the generosity of your church around the world with the tools necessary to respond with a tangible love of Jesus Christ. 
Heavenly Father, we do continue in this church also to pray that you would be around those who need healing. We pray continued healing for Reverend Tinklenberg, continued healing for Angie Reisma, for Carly Jansen, for Scott Mulder, for Arvin Prinson, for Stan Hawk. Heavenly Father, we continue to pray that you would watch over Catherine Visser as she continues to lean upon you in this final season of life. Gracious God, we ask that you would go with the uh, Dean and Tara Deckers today as they head to uh, where their birth mother prepares to give birth in the coming week. We just ask that you would walk with them, or that you would, your will would be done in this situation, that you would give peace to them and to the birth mother, or that you would walk beside them in every moment of this journey, and that you would lift them up. Heavenly Father, we pray for others who are walking the road of adoption, that you would open the right doors in your time. We pray for those who are struggling with mental illness in these days, that you would lift us from the darkness and the clouds, and that your spirit would give us a taste of your presence in us. Lord, we thank you that our salvation is not dependent on our emotions or our feelings. We thank you that our salvation is dependent on your feeling for us, your love for us shown in the cross. Heavenly Father, we do pray for those who grieve today. We pray especially with Neil and Trina, with Myron and Fran and their families as they grieve John's loss. This brother-in-law, we pray that you would surround them, that you would give them hope. Lord, for others of us who feel a new and even continued the sting of death and loss, we pray that you would walk beside us through these summer months that you would be the one who is nearer to us than a spouse, than a parent, than a child, or that you also would remind us that this world is moving to the day when all things will be made new. So receive our prayers, receive our gifts and our offerings. As you gather us in tonight again for a community worship service, receive the praise of a unified church. For we offer these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We give our gifts and our offerings now for the ministry of this congregation, first and the second for the ministry of Christian education.
Friends, we'll receive God's parting blessing in between singing some stanzas of a song, The Risen Christ. As we read Scripture, the Holy Spirit is God, fully God. You know, he's the silent or the shy person in the Trinity because the Spirit's work is not to wave his hands and to draw attention to himself, but to point us to Jesus. And so on this Pentecost Sunday, it's appropriate our closing song speaks of the risen Christ because that's what the Spirit would have us speak. We'll sing stanza one, receive God's blessing, and then we'll sing st- one and three, and then we'll sing stanza four. After the service, again, we're going to invite it just to, to leave as normal during the postlude. Um, if you are a guest, there is coffee and juice. You're welcome to, to enjoy those things. But for those who are interested, please, after you get some coffee or use the bathroom, come immediately back into the service of the sanctuary for a Q&A if you have any questions about the vote next week Sunday about that property. That'll be right after the service, so come immediately back in if you're interested in that. But as you do that, let's stand to sing as the music begins, The Risen Christ. Friends, as you leave this place on Pentecost Sunday, go with this blessing. The grace of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit within and around you be with each of you now and forevermore. Amen.